oh, just let your daughter cry out and then she'll be sleep trained and you'll be all right. And I said, no, I believe in the attachment theory. If my daughter wants to sleep on my chest for the whole night, that's what would happen. And that's what I'd done. Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Borostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of this podcast. Here, we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well. As we're heading into the holiday season, I'd like to revisit some of my favorite conversations. And this week's guest was very popular, especially one of her clips about the cry it out method, which went viral on Instagram. Meet Dr. Patricia Brito, an educational psychologist. In this short episode, we talk about attachment theory, whether the cry it out method works, and strategies for supporting neurodivergent kids. So if you want to raise future leaders, are a parent of a neurodivergent child, or are wondering what made you such an anxious adult, this episode is for you. Before you start the video, I need your help. We've entered the British Podcast Awards and the Listener's Choice category is now open for voting. You can directly support our show by voting for us. So just click the link in the description, look up Anatomy of a Leader, and get voting. As always, please hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening. And without further ado, here is Dr. Patricia Britter. Attachment is the opportunity for a child to create a bond with a primary caregiver mm -hmm. from when they're born. And not all children develop a secure attachment style because that would involve a parent or primary caregiver, whether it's a guardian or a carer, uh, meeting the child's needs and helping the child to feel secure. Um, and children who develop that go on, according to you know the attachment theory, go on to have a thriving lives and succeed and um, they have um, less concerns in terms of social interaction in terms of forming you know positive relationships and so forth um, but not all children develop secure attachment styles so, and is that to do with the child or is it to do with the parent it's to do with the situation I would say because I don't want parents to take blame to be honest um, it's to do with circumstances. So I, I work with a lot of children who have gone into care because they were born into circumstances. Maybe their parents were alcohol and drug addicts and couldn't care for them. And all their parents had experienced poverty, for example. You know, let's talk about that, you know, the social economic crisis and how that's impacting people, um, which means the parents are not emotionally available to provide that love, care, and support to their children and meet their needs. Um, cultural and religious practices sometimes influence the development of attachment difficulties. So for example, when I had a child in my culture, a lot of people believe in the cry out system, which I absolutely hate. <laughs> so I was advised, oh, just let your daughter cry out, let her cry out and then you know she'll be sleep trained and you'll be all right. And I said, no, I believe in the attachment theory. If my daughter wants to sleep on my chest, for the whole night, that's what would happen. And that's what I'd done, you know. Mm. Um, this advice of, you know, when the child is six months, put them in their own room. No, my, my child slipped in our bed up until she was one. And then, you know, and even now she's free and she wants to come into our room halfway through the night and that's okay. It's about having that closeness, that love, that bond, helping her to feel secure and confident, helping her to know that we are not going anywhere. And what that has is, I mean, all children go through separation anxiety at some point in their life at the early stages, but now she's so secure. So she can go to preschool and say, bye mommy. She knows I'm coming back. Mm. And she trusts that I'm coming back. And it's having a ripple effect on her in her confidence, her confidence in building um, relationships with her peers and you know engaging in parallel play because that's what's age appropriate developmentally for her stage at the moment. And developing relationships with adults as well. So it has a positive ripple effect. So you have those who develop an anxious attachment style, avoidant attachment style, uh, because of the circumstances they were exposed mm. to during their early years, whether it's trauma, neglect, and, and so forth. And those symptoms mirror symptoms of autism. That's very interesting. Going back to the cry out method, I'm mm. curious, what does the data say about that? You think that that's not the right approach? Yeah. And having that closeness and being emotionally there as well as physically there for your child yeah. is the approach that you have yourself taken. Yes. What is the data about 
the cried out method? I'm not quite sure if research has specifically looked at that. But if you look at research linked to the attachment theory, it's about having closeness and being emotionally available for your mm. child and being present and offer meeting your child's needs. Uh, you know, picture it this way. Children come into the world, the only voices they hear when they're in a womb is probably the mother's voice that they recognise the most and the father's voice or, um, you know, wh whoever's around um, a pregnant woman um, or, or a pregnant person. And um, when they are born, they are almost like new to, well, they are new, they're new to a brand new world and they need to be nurtured, they need to be cared for, they need to develop trust, they need to, you know, develop that sense of security and to not develop a sense of abandonment or experience neglect or trauma. Every individual wants to be loved and be loved. So that's why I think that's important and that's my method. Um, I mean, I'm not against people who want to take that approach. I never tell people don't do this or do that. That's not my place. I'll just share what research shows mm. and it's entirely up to you which method you choose to take. Mm. Um, but for me, I mean, I've seen it work in my household um, in terms of I cared about attachment from the moment she was born, <laughs> you know, um, not just for myself, but for my husband as well. You know, it was, it was really important for us to have that skin to skin contact with um, for my child and my husband to have that um, continuously, actually, for them to develop that bond um, and for her to feel that extreme sense of love and confidence that we are coming back mm. so we never really experienced separate separation anxiety for that long mm. well i have two kids yeah i've done some av testing okay. on this okay. <laughs> the first child did attempt the cried out method yeah uh not probably not to the same extent as probably what the books will tell you to do mm. but to some degree there have been days where she would cry out to go to sleep it was the most excruciatingly awful thing that I have gone through mm. and I never did that with my second son with my son who was the second born and I still think that my daughter is probably more anxious and I really boil it down to the kind of crying out and my son I find he's a lot easier to deal with emotions he gets more comforted much easier so the difference between them is quite marked I know kids are different mm. but I really do think that those two styles mm. have like impacted so I would, that's interesting if I were to have a, a, a yeah. child again I would not do the cry out method just wouldn't I'm glad we agree on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I mean it's traumatizing for the parent I can only imagine what it's like for the child. Exactly. Where you're just like completely abandoned. Yeah, and you're brand new to the world mm -hmm. and you're still developing skills. Your brain is still developing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yesterday on my social media, I posted something about the prefrontal cortex and how actually it doesn't develop up until you're almost 30. And the reason why the age range I work with is up to 25 is because research shows you don't become an adult until that age so actually a lot of your uh, responses will be impulsive because the emotional part of your brain the amygdala is what's driving that and um, think about a baby who is still developing their brain still trying to become accustomed to where they are you know is if babies could talk about that experience from you know, being in a womb to being born, that it's in itself is traumatizing, I think, to be honest. So I think it's really important to give them that love, that support, that cuddling as much as possible. And um, that's why I don't agree with it. It just, mm. it just doesn't sit well with me. Mm. You talk about that the, the, the attachment difficulties can be very similar to, you know, being on the spectrum, talking yes. about autism. Yes, some traits. Um, yes. Talk me through how as a parent you can support a child with autism or adhd okay so when it comes to autism let's tackle that first it's a big spectrum so um you and i may have traits for example but that doesn't necessarily mean we are on um we fit the profile to have a diagnosis according to the um, dsm-5 for example or um, the assessment tools um so when you do have a child with a diagnosis of autism spectrum condition, it's important to get to know your child and get to know how they present 
what are their difference and what's unique to them because that's the baseline of the strategies that any professional may suggest and how to actually support them so for example if your child is non-verbal which I have to say being non-verbal doesn't mean your child has autism your child may just have a speech language difficulty uh, but children who are non-verbal and have the diagnosis of autism if that's the case, strategies such as using visual aids, using um, non-verbal communication cues like uh, picture exchange communication, we call it PEX. It's a method where a child can use a visual to exchange for something else that they want. You can use things like objects of reference to communicate with them. So for example, a cup could represent that they want a drink. So you could train them to use that to communicate because whether they have this diagnosis or not, you want them to be able to function adequately to their potential, to maximize their potential. And um, so it's important to get to know your child and whether you're a parent or a school staff, you need to get to know the children that you're working with and the children that you, you live with, you know, whether your aunt, uncle, um, regardless of who you are. So I think that's the first step. And then if you were to read parenting books or you were to get strategies from someone like me, you can then apply that and you can pitch it at the appropriate level. For example, um, some children who are verbal and can engage in social skills program would need that. So I would I would you know recommend social skills program. For example, something called Circle of Friends. Uh, these are evidence based research shows that they work or they they make a positive difference. Um, that's you know those are the kind of things that I would suggest. And what's really important, I think, no one really talks about is emotional regulation strategies mm. not just for the children for the parents you've been listening to anatomy of a leader with me maria vorostovsky if you love listening to these inspiring leadership stories from all walks of life and would like to support our show the best thing you can do is to subscribe or follow wherever you are listening thank you so much and i'll see you in the next episode